everyone, I'm Cristo Contreras and I'm the director of Inforum. Welcome to today's program, The Full Plate with Aisha Curry. Aisha joins us in honor of her new book, The Full Plate, flavor-filled easy recipes for families with no time and a lot to do. The conversation will be moderated by Justin Phillips, food writer and columnist with the San Francisco Chronicle. If you'd like to ask either of our speakers a question during this program, you can do so in the chat section of the live stream that you're watching. The Commonwealth Club has temporarily suspended in-person events, but we are dedicated to keeping you informed during this pandemic. We're going full speed ahead with the full slate of live online programming. Most of these conversations are currently free to the public, so we do ask that you consider donating to the club to help us continue our work. You can visit us at commonwealthclub.org slash online to learn more, and you can text the word donate to 415-329-4231 live during this program. Now, please join me in welcoming Aisha Curry and Justin Phillips to Inform. Good evening. Welcome to today's virtual program with Inform at the Commonwealth Club. I'm Justin Phillips, a food writer and columnist for the San Francisco Chronicle. This afternoon, I am super, super excited to be in conversation with Aisha Curry. Aisha is, how can I run all of this down? A chef, entrepreneur, television host, New York Times bestselling cookbook author. You might know her from social media where she may have taught you how to make crab bucatini or lobster rolls. You might also know her from her work in the Bay Area through her family foundation called Eat, Play, Learn. She joined us today to talk about her new cookbook, The Full Plate, flavor-filled, easy recipes for families with no time and a lot to do. Uh, let me add this. If you would like to ask Aisha questions, please ask it in the chat, and we'll try to get through as many as possible towards the end of this conversation. So now, let's get started. And Aisha, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Good it's, to see you. Same. It's so good. It's always so nice to talk to you. And, Thank uh, you so much. Thank I mean, you. I have to ask, I know you've been through this whole process before, um, but the, the book is out there. The cookbook is out. People are getting it. People are loving it. How are you feeling? It, I mean, it, it's something that never gets old, right? It's not something that happens every day. And so... I always say it's like birthing a baby. I mean, <laughs> the thick of the the thick of the hard work took about nine months. And so it really mm -hmm. feels like birthing another child once pub day hits and it's out into the world. And I feel like I have a really cute baby because people <laughs> have been so receptive to the cookbook. I've been seeing people cook recipes and that's, I think that that is the most exciting part. When you see somebody execute your writing and your vision and your recipe. Mm. You see, they talk about the flavors and um, have the confidence to post up something that they created. Like that, that means the world to me um, because it means I've done my job, so. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Before, so I'm gonna get into all the cookbook stuff, but before I just wanna ask the general, how's uh, pandemic life treating you and the family? How are you guys doing? How's everyone? We can't complain. Um, it's go. It's it's going. It's going well. Um, school's crazy, but <laughs> I, I feel like I wouldn't dare complain um, because our, our our kids are fine. Um, yeah. Still getting their education. We're just trying to keep our heads on straight with it all. Um, yeah. I don't know. We're enjoying. You know, with basketball, it's not the same right now. It's not happening right now, and so. Yeah. We're just enjoying having uh, Stefan home. Kids are enjoying having their dad home and just kind of finding the silver linings in in togetherness and being mm. able to sit at the dinner table more often together and enjoy a nice cocktail or five. It's been it's been quite lovely. And then on the flip side, just doing what we can to help the community because we know you know, how difficult it is right now and how much people just haven't stepped up to the plate. And so it's been nice to gather with so many powerful forces throughout the, the Bay Area to, to kind of get it done as best we can um, for people, so. That's great. I'm gonna touch on, I'm gonna try to, there's so much stuff to ask you, but I'm gonna try to touch on each one of those things. But I will say this, let me just start by saying uh, the full plate is honestly like, as a food writer, it's one of the best cookbooks I've ever picked up. I, Thank you. I, really? Oh my God. I, I absolutely love it. Uh, Thank you. And part of it is like, um, it's very now. You can like, uh, and uh, we'll get into this too, but look, 
let me let me just start by saying it's different. I imagine releasing a cookbook during a pandemic is different, right? Because now these things aren't just decoration on a bookshelf. Mm-hmm. We're all at home cooking, so they have to be uh, applicable to what you do in the kitchen. How do you make sure that a cookbook is something that um, isn't just like one of the things that you brag about, but is actually useful for people? And I, I feel like that's why it's really popular right now. How do you do that? I think for me, that's why it took so long for me to publish a second cookbook is because I always said after the first one, that was everything I grew up with on. That was, you know, things that I'd been cooking for since I was a teenager. Like it was all there mm. and I just had to get it on the pages, like get it out. This took ideation and I always knew that that was going to be the case. And so I always said I wouldn't start working on a second one until it was ref- a reflection of what I was actually experiencing and things that I actually felt like I needed. And the time finally came, um, you know, in the midst of our chaos, me having Canon and us having three children and I work full time, Stefan works full time. And we were both just trying to figure it out. Um, and while we do have help, we, we, we don't have maybe as much as people would, would think we do. And so it really is a struggle to get the meal on the table at the end of the day. Um, but it's something that I take pride in as a mom. And I really love being able to feed my family and make them happy that way. I mean, we've talked a million times and I've told you like, that's my love language and it's really all I know how to do Mm -hmm. to make people happy. Um, And so I was, I knew I needed to keep that alive. And so for me, this is a curation of recipes for myself to be able to do that. Um, And so my, my only hope was that it would inspire other people to do the same. But if nobody felt that way, I, I, I'm happy that at least I have this arsenal to be able to do that. And so it really is a reflection of like where I'm at in my life right now and that I love food. I don't, I don't, I don't eat to live. Like I live to eat and so it needed to be fast and easy, but it needed to be power packed with like umami and flavor and, and spice. And so this is that. Yeah, that's awesome. You know, I, uh- as a consumer, I just wake up and see your cookbook and I'm like, cool, this is great. I'm gonna go ahead and grab it and use it. Can you talk about how much work goes into these things and kind of like what you've learned over doing uh, two really good ones now? Like what's, give us a peek behind the curtain. What's that process like? It's, it's, in, it's insane. Uh, people wouldn't believe how many moving parts there are. Um, and my experience with the first cookbook is completely different from what I've experienced with the full plate. With this cookbook, like the plate was really full. And so I had to, you know, rely on, I wanted, I'm creative and I wanted to make sure that the recipes were all mine, that I got my hands dirty, that they were true to me. Um, But then you have things like, you know, what's, how does, how is the cookbook going to look? And like a creative director and a photographer and food stylists and prop stylists and, you know, somebody to, to, to spell, to, to, to correct all of the grammar and like, cause that I'm not great there. So I really like we, a whole team of people, my amazing book editor, um, uh, the team, the whole team at little Brown voracious, um, like there's just so, 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 so many people. Um, I it's, it's, it's madness and everybody's working on a schedule. You have deadlines you have to meet. Um, I would almost imagine that it's no different from being at the Chronicle and like having to, you know, meet the deadlines and get the story done. And, and it, there's yeah. so many, you, you can't do it all by yourself. Um, and so for me, it, this is a reflection of that. And it's a reflection too of me, like letting go a little bit cause I'm a control freak. <laughs> um, but I'm glad that I did because the, I, I have a, a great product in my hand that like is really going to be helpful to people and so I'm happy I went that route but it's there's a lot of moving parts and that's why that's why they're not free (laughs) because because there's people that there's people that have all of these different roles and do it for a living and do it very well and um you know they deserve to 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 have the back end of of that (laughs) yeah that's that's why they're not free people Mm -hmm. it's a lot of work so I don't want to give too much away, but I want to get into, uh, they're like part, I like the whole book, but there are definitely parts that I want to highlight. And I think, um, I just love that you started out with this opening section of bites and booze, because I can tell you this, if I'm at any friend's 
in our pre-pandemic life, if I'm at a friend's like dinner party, mm -hmm. I'm gonna eat all their snacks and I'm gonna drink their early cocktails because that's one of my favorite parts of yeah. like a dinner event. But you've put together like just this really cute, this really thoughtful introduction to the book. Can you talk about why you started there instead of, uh, instead of somewhere else? Absolutely. For me, it's, it's the unwind of the day unwind of the day. Like, <laughs> I, I, I truly believe like it's that dinner shouldn't be, it shouldn't give you anxiety. Yeah. Um, and so for me, that starts with a nice cocktail, mocktail, whatever it may be, but just something to slow you down a little bit and then to slow your guests or your family down. So those little bites, I mean, it, it's, it gets everybody satisfied and it, it gives you the space and the freedom to be able to prepare your meal without feeling that anxiety. And it also gets everybody in the kitchen and mm. the conversation starts flowing. And, you know, I, I truly believe that the kitchen is the hub of, of the home. And so I like the idea that people can gather in there while the meal is being prepared, but they're still fed and satisfied. It, it It's the only way it works for me is to mm. have a little something to nosh on and a nice drink, whether it's for myself or the people that are over. I just think it makes sense and it, it, it creates this kind of like routine and tradition. Um, and I just, I love, I, that's why I started it, the book. Yeah. Like yeah. And one of the, one of the cocktails, well, actually there's a couple of cocktails that stick out to me, but I was curious if there's a backstory for the spicy Serrano margarita. I looked at that, uh, I looked at that recipe. Everything that's it. what I figured. That's what I figured. Yes. And I was like, that one looks like a lot of fun. And then there's also the island punch, which I thought, is that like oh, a yeah. punch spin? Yeah, see, yeah. that so, kind of is fun. I would love to hear the backstories for some Yeah, time. so I'm trying to find the picture here. To, yeah. That's all about that basil. That is not my spicy serrano. Um, but I, so I, I got tired of like the mundane, like margarita. They're great mm. sometimes, but I wanted to jazz it up a little bit. And I was reading up, just on infused. This is what I do in my spare time, everyone. I was reading up on infused simple syrups. <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh. So I had my garden in, 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 in our backyard. And I was like, I have all of these serrano peppers. I don't know what to do with them. My kids don't eat them. I, I sometimes I blend them into like a, a mash, a, a, my parsnip uh, puree, a little serrano in there, but it's barely enough it's like enough to where it's you, you have that flavor but it's not spicy for the kids mm -hmm. I'm like, what do i do with the rest of these and i was like i'm gonna make a freaking serrano simple syrup and so you kind of simmer the serranos in there and then you blend it all together so your cocktail gets this gorgeous uh greenish color and you have the little bits of serrano and it's just so good so that's how that came about it was really sheer need to use up produce <laughs> <laughs> yes, I like that. I like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then um, the island. And, and it's so funny because when I did the cocktails chapter, once I finished developing everything, I had about 17 friends over pre pandemic to do a whole tasting. We were going to do <laughs> so funny. We were going to do the, the tasting. I had what, eight, nine, maybe 10 different cocktails. And then we were going to watch Hustlers. <laughs> so that tells you what, gotcha. what time that was at. Yeah. Yeah. Came out. Um, and it was one of the ones I was uncertain about. And I was like, I, I don't know if this one will make it in. And everybody was like, no, keep it. So people really enjoyed it. I was like, all right, we're, we're, we're doing a spicy mark. But I didn't want to do traditional jalapeno. And yeah. Toronto's just were perfect. And then with the island punch, that is like from my childhood. Not drinking it from my childhood, but seeing it <laughs> at every family function mm -hmm. like in a big vat sometimes it would be in like the gatorade cooler for uh -huh. the parties and it's just it's an easy way to use what you have on hand and throw it together and still create something delicious that's so awesome. it's at every party i've ever been to growing up <laughs> i love it that's all that's amazing and the there's uh so then what there are a couple other things so one of the things that stood out to me and i hate to admit this but um you have a grilled cheese recipe in there and the grilled cheese, uh, God, this is a terrible thing to admit as a food writer. I didn't understand the value of putting mayonnaise on the outside of the bread when you cook it until very late in life. Really? I, yes, I feel like I missed out for years without understanding that. Can you tell me, um, 
what makes like the the perfect grilled cheese sandwich i think i think it is that and it's so controversial for me to say mayonnaise (laughs) it is that little bit of mayonnaise on the outside of the bread it gives you that crunchy golden brown crispy crust without like having to use too much butter or anything and if you think about it like logically it actually makes sense because mayonnaise is like the foundation of mayonnaise is eggs and you know when you go to batter something or make something you always dredge it in a, in a little bit of egg and flour and then you have this gorgeous crispy crust and so it makes sense with the with the grilled cheese for me what makes it and you'll see this throughout the book i'm a sweet and savory girl mm-hmm. and so that little bit of preserve um apricot or fig whatever you have on hand i feel like it's just such a nice surprise mm-hmm. and then adding in like a protein you can be inventive with your grilled cheese and so you know, in this case, it's the the prosciutto or the pancetta. Um, and it, it gives this like salty bite to it. And then, um, you know, any type of cheese you have on hand, but really making sure that you get that like crispiness. Yeah. It's like my, I, I want to hear that sandwich when I bite into it. Yeah. I mean, I feel like everyone during this, uh, I feel like most people during the pandemic are like relying on comfort foods just because mm-hmm. they're like, you know, low key kind of stressed out and like a grilled cheese is a perfect thing. So we'll go from there into uh, I really like the pastas and things that you had in the book, too. That's one of my favorite chapters. as well. Oh, my God. See, and I, and I wonder and I'm curious about this because and, and I may be way off, but I feel like pastas are a good uh, vehicle for getting kids to eat. Be- better like how how do you yeah like what is that what does that pasta section mean to you in, in I, life? Feel, I feel like kids just hear pasta and they're like oh yeah i'm i'm game uh, <laughs> but for me what i love about it is it really is like a good face it's almost like what rice is to, to to some people like that's what pasta is to my family because it really is a way to like layer on flavor um and have that hearty comfort um and for me i always it always helps me to give my kids some sort of job in the kitchen so I can get the meal done. So whether it's like chopping up a veggie for me um, or like picking herbs, whatever it is, like there, there's something for them to do. And then we've talked about this before as well, but like when you cook with your kids or give them a simple task, they're almost always going to try whatever it is that you're putting in front mm-hmm. of them. Mm-hmm. And so for me, one of my absolute favorite in, in the book is the Rasta pasta. Um, and that's something that my auntie Donna, my best friend, Shrain's mom would make growing up and so delicious. Everyone always requested it. And so I put my spin on it, but it's the way that I've actually introduced curry to my kid. <laughs> that sounds so funny. Oh, wow. but curry powder. That's the way that I've introduced that to my kids because it's in the form of pasta. They have no clue what's going on. And they're like, this is delicious. And it's like this flavor bomb in your mouth. Um, and now they love curry. Oh, wow. uh, but then there's the bell pepper in there and shrimp, chicken, if you want it. Um, and so it really is just this flavor bomb of a pasta. Yeah. And you would just, it's a great way to trick your kids, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> everyone make a note of that. Yeah, the, uh, yeah no, I, I was literally about to ask about that recipe next because it, you know, on there, there was like, I think there was like two pounds of shrimp and I was like, got me yeah. <laughs> cilantro and ginger and there's just a bunch of stuff for it and I, th- I thought it was really really great but you know y- you talked about like learning that dish for, did you say this from a family member from your aunt yeah maybe? yeah my auntie so, Donna so so it's like you also I, you also give a piece of yourself in these cookbooks like there's like a it, there's something very personal about that how do you figure out what stories to keep for yourself, like a recipe that might be very, very personal and decide what you can share and be okay with it, you know? I I feel like with the recipes, the stories behind them, like nothing's really off limits just because I like the way that I'm able to convey, if that's the right word, to Mm -hmm. people, how powerful food can be and how you can correlate like memories to, to meals. Um, and just the nostalgia that comes with that, good or bad. Um, and I just, I hope that it like inspires people to like create their own memories. And so when it comes to the stories behind the food, I mean, there's a million I could tell. And I, I like really enjoy telling them and sharing that part of myself with people through the, through the recipes. And so yeah. I, I don't think anything's off limits in, in that sense. 
I will, yeah, that's great. Because if you think about it, you know, the, the idea would be years and years from now, like young kids now when they become older and maybe become parents and their kids, like this might be one of those books that they're like pulling off the shelf, like, all right. That'd be very cool. You know what I mean? Like it, it's hard. It's, there's like a legacy aspect of, you know, cookbooks that I don't think really gets appreciated as much. And is that something that you think about too? Like, yes, yes. Yeah. yes. And that's why I was, that's why the process is so nervous. No, yeah. I mean, nerve wracking, nervous. That's why I'm so nervous throughout the process. Like it's, it's there forever. It's, yeah. printed, it's in the universe. It's on people's shelves. It's in people's homes. You can't really control where it goes. And so, like every single word in the book is just kind of like a piece of you and you just want to hold it tight, mm -hmm. but also at the same time you want it out there because you want to make like an impact, even if it is with a meal. Um, and so for me, yeah, it's so important. I think about it all the <laughs> time. All I'm, the time. I'm glad I brought it up. So yeah. this, this is another thing too. One of the, uh, and we've talked about this before, but um, dinner in a household is really important. Uh, but I think it's good for you to talk about, because um, I, I mean, I, I guess everyone has different ideas of what it means to them, but for you personally, the idea of dinner in a house, like what does that mean? What is, how is that beneficial to a family? Like, why is that so important? I think for me, looking back, I'm like grateful to my parents for making those family dinners a priority to some capacity. So like, just like I said in the book, it doesn't happen every night. For some families it does, but for most, I feel like it's very unrealistic. Um, but having that cadence and that, you know, once a week, twice a week, three times, however many times you can do it a week, dinner with your family, it's so important just because you don't realize until you finally sit down and enjoy the meal together, like what you're missing mm -hmm. and how fabulous the dinners are and how much it brings people together, how much you learn about your kids, their feelings, their emotions, their thoughts, how much they learn about you as parents, like allow, I encourage people to like allow their kids to ask them questions at the dinner table. Mm -hmm. um, it's so funny. I was sitting with my grandma uh, a couple weeks ago and she was like, Oh, everybody's talking at the dinner table. And I was like, well, yeah, grandma, <laughs> this is like typically where we do most of the talking. And she's like, Hmm. She's like, she said, things change, things change. And I was like, yeah, grandma, like, this is where, this is a good thing. Like, it's like, yeah, we encourage the kids to talk at the table because we want to hear what they have to say. And it's like our opportunity to slow down, put the phones down, pause and check in with each other. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's why, you know, and she was like, oh, like she never process she never thought about yeah. it. She was like, oh, like it made so much sense once I finished explaining it and um, I just, I notice a difference. Like if there's a week that goes by and we haven't had a dinner together because we've been out of town or something, not lately, but like if we've been out of town away from each other, um, I notice a difference, like the energy is different in the yeah. house. And then you get together at that table and things are just, sparks are flying and the kids are happy. And there are actual studies that show if you sit around the dinner table with your children, I think it's at least once a week, their grades are better. Yeah. Their vocabulary is better. It's just like, it's just one of those simple things that can really impact a child and make a difference. And so it's always been just so important for me. Um, and it really grounds you as well, even as a, as a parent. Um, I, I just, I, I'm big on it. Yeah. And it can't be dinner. And breakfast, if that's your thing. It's not our thing because our mornings just don't operate like that typically. We yeah, have yeah. occasionally, but that's why I wanted the focus to be different because, I mean, the focus to be different with the book and focus on dinner because that's what's true to us. But whatever meal, even if it's a snack, like get around the table with your family. Yeah. Um, so. I definitely believe the, uh, the grades thing too because like as a kid, eating dinner with my parents, I knew that they would ask about something from school. Yes. So I was like, you can't lie, but you might as well do it before you get there. And then, exactly. and I do, yeah. And you're right. It does set like a fountain. Cause there's, 
it's so easy to be distracted. It does kind of set a foundation for that. Mm-hmm. Do you think like the the role of the dinner table is changing during the pandemic? Because like people who probably never thought about this before are now spending more time, you know, if they worked a lot more time with their families, um, you know, they have like, maybe if they live with roommates or spending more time like that, like, do you think the, the yeah. how do you I see think it? it goes both ways. So mm-hmm. I think for a lot of people that didn't do it before, they're now having the opportunity or just the idea, like the light bulb's going off to even think about doing it, which is great. And then on the flip side, you know, you have your frontline workers and Mm -hmm. your, you know, people that aren't really ever off the clock at home because, you know, work's running long and at the end of the night, you're just like, take out it is. And that's okay too. Um, But just to, I just want to, I guess, encourage people to just take the time to like, just at least once a week, just check in with your family around that table. Um, and I know it's hard. It's not an easy thing, but I saw yeah. this Instagram. I wouldn't call it a meme. It was like a little tile with some words on it. And it was like, choose your hard. Cause it was like, it, it said like marriage is hard, but like divorce is also hard. And choose oh, your that's, hard. And it that's was pretty like, good. it like gave this list of like all these different things where it was like, choose your heart. And it's like, it's like sitting around the dinner table, like, pressing the pause button it's hard um but so is like neglecting the conversation that's that's a hard choice too so it's like choose your heart and it's just like yeah so i just encourage that's really that's that's really really good i'm gonna have to steal that (laughs) yeah i hope it made sense but like it was perfect it just it popped up in my mind and i was like hmm it's kind of the same situation it's not necessarily easy to get to that table yeah once you get there it's worth it it's pretty great you know, uh, so going to the stuff that people learn um, during the pandemic, you, so I remember um, when International Smoke was opening and then I got to talk to you for the first time and all the, it feels like a lifetime ago, but all this stuff was like brand new. And now being um, at the head of a project like that, like the, it's such a, such a tough time for restaurants, it's such a confusing time. Um, what have you learned over that time? And maybe like, what are you still learning about the business? And I'd love to hear like what, what you're learning from International Smoke and all that during this. It's been extremely tough and tumultuous and nerve wracking and confusing Yeah. Um, for all restaurants. Um, but if I, I would say if there's one takeaway from the experience it's how resilient everyone is from from front of house to back of house, like and everything in between, like just like the way, you know, shifts go every single night when the restaurants were booming. Yeah. Like that same resilience that it takes night in, day in, day out, people were able to 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 carry over that resilience into figuring out a way. Um, it's kind of like, you know, if you can't, if you, if you can't use the road, like you build the bridge or yeah, 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 yeah. tunnel, it's like, it's I've, everyone, everyone's just been so resilient. And from my side of things with the people I work with on a daily basis, like everybody's remained positive, which blows my mind. Um, cause even on days when I haven't been so positive, like every everyone else seems to be. So it's been, it's been really eye opening. Um, and I'm just grateful for, to have such an amazing team and group of supporters around me, um, and with me. And I'm just happy to be there for everybody as best as I can. Um, but it looks like we're turning a corner and things are starting to look up. So it's, it's, it's nice. We were able for us to be able to do deliveries and things like that. And so that, that's, that was helpful, but what a time to be alive. I'm telling you. Like. I, we've been like writing about it so much. And uh, actually, so I, I checked in with like Michael not too long ago. Yeah. That he was doing. But man, it is it is such a, it's a crazy time for the industry. Such a crazy time. So, so insane. Um, all right. So I also want to make sure, like I mentioned before, like your social and community work. And I feel like that's such a... Uh, you guys have made such, you especially have made such an imprint on the community out here. And uh, I know Eat, Learn, Play uh, was created to help underserved children in Oakland have access to food. 
Uh, I imagine like the pandemic has probably kicked it into overdrive, but I would love to hear. Uh, yeah, you just talk about like what's going on now with it. What what things you have going on? Yeah, so we're a little over a year old now. Last July, so we're in, we're in October now. Mm-hmm. So a little bit over a year old, and we just never thought, you know, that the obviously nobody did that the pandemic would hit and just blow everything out of the water. And so we definitely had to pivot and pivot fast yeah. um, to make sure that people, children, families were, were, were being fed. And I will say like the Oakland Unified School District and all of our partners and everybody really stepped up and stepped up fast to help us. Alameda County Community Food Bank, like everyone stepped up and came together so fast to be able to provide these meals and do it safely. And so we've been able to provide, oh gosh, what are we at now? I think we're over 10 million meals um, wow. throughout the pandemic. Um, yeah. We'll be able to make sure that Oakland families are fed that need the help. Um, Cause our, our whole mission has always been that it takes a village. And you know, that saying is from the beginning of time and it, it always rings true no matter who you are. And, so we just really wanted to be that village for for people that don't don't have that themselves. Yeah. Um, and we're working on, you know, making sure that from an from a learn perspective that, you know, kids have access to internet because that's been one of the biggest problems is yes. Oh, wow. Yes, online school is available, but what happens when you don't have access to proper internet? And so we've been um, working to ensure that that people have access to that. Wow. Um, yeah. And it's just been, it's been a whirlwind. The need is growing every single week and we've somehow been able to keep up with that. And so we're very grateful. Um, but I mean, there's, it's a long, there's, there's such a long road ahead. So, yeah. Yeah. um, just trying to stay boots on the ground and, and keep amping up as best we can. You know, I, and I know how, how like close to the heart these, these issues are for you, but I always think it's interesting to hear you talk about that too, because you have kids at home. And so when you're running these organizations that focus on helping kids, like there's a, there's a very personal element of it. Cause I'm sure you can see your kids in some of these yeah. young people that you're yeah. dealing with. Like, can you talk about uh, that emotional tie to these things? This isn't, you know, these are significant. I think that's really the root of it is, you know, cause that's when, that's when I, I started advocating to end childhood hunger way back in 2012 when, when Riley was born. You look at your child and then you hear the statistics, you know, at the time it was one in, one in six kids are, are, you know, hungry in America here in our backyards. Like, excuse me, like that doesn't, this is America. Like that doesn't make any sense. Um, and now of course the numbers are staggering given the, the circumstances. And it's just like, I, uh, you just feel a fire inside of you and you're like, how can we help? Like, what can we do? There's no reason this should be happening. And so, I mean, there's a long road, hopefully shorter than I think, but to, to ending this thing, but we're working on it as best yeah. we can. Yeah. Um, and again, really that whole village effect, being able to, you know, um, work with people who are already doing amazing things to amplify has really been the key for us. And then I completely left out um, that one of the best things we've been able to do is to help restaurants reopen. And so it's this whole whole full circle thing where, you know, restaurants are, are preparing these meals for the families. And so they're able to open and um, employ staff and so reducing that unemployment rate Mm -hmm. and on the flip side we're getting produce from local farmers where you know produce is just going to waste right now yeah we've been able to get that produce from them to bring into the restaurant so everybody can prepare the meal so it's a whole a whole cycle yeah Uh, but it's just great to see the community coming together that's amazing yeah that's awesome speaking of uh so we'll get back into some like I took it heavy there for a minute, asking about that. <laughs> so we'll talk about some lighter stuff. I'm curious about this too. The uh, so your cookbook, I feel like, uh, has a focus on being able to fit budgets too, because you can like replace items and use what you have. Can you talk yes. about? Um, yeah, can you talk about like emphasizing that part too, like making sure that uh, these things are for everybody? I think that's something to highlight. Yes, that that is a message that I hope. Uh, rings true to everybody watching at home 
is that if you're looking at something like, let's say the lobster roll, lobster's expensive. I get it. Like this is like, <laughs> we're talking, this is like a treat meal. Uh, and if you can't get your, your hands on lobster, like I make it very clear, like bay shrimp, the little bay shrimp that you get at the grocery store, perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. If you do it with canned tuna, do it with canned tuna. Like really the whole purpose of this book is to be able to mix and swap. I want people to write all over the book, swap out the proteins, um, you know, use mushroom and jackfruit in place of, in place of proteins. If you're a vegetarian or vegan, like it's the possibilities are endless. And so really I would consider these like true base recipes for you to be able to layer in whatever proteins, beans, whatever you, you want. Like it's yeah. not anything really goes in here. Even I, I'm looking at like right now, like the mahi mahi kebabs, mm -hmm. like whatever fish you have on hand. If you wanted to do it with salmon, do it with salmon. If you needed to use tilapia, tilapia is thin. So like take your tilapia, fold it over to make it a little thicker and put it on the skewer mm -hmm. and then you're good to go. Um, <laughs> but yeah, the idea is really like you can swap things out. And yeah. It's fine. They're yeah. really based recipes. Yeah. Yeah, and the idea that you get to write in the margins too and make it your own—it's like a—it's like exactly. a notebook, basically. I encourage it. I encourage it. Do you? Um, so, how, like, I, I imagine with as much as you like cooking, have you? Are you like using Instacart now? Do you miss like not being able to regularly go to the store? And what's the what's cooking at home like for you now <laughs> during yes, the pandemic? Yes, I am. I am an avid Instacart user. <laughs> Um, again, I feel like it's another like full cycle thing. You're, you're staying safe. Well, also like, you know, it's a drop for somebody. Yeah. You're yeah. getting the groceries that you need. And so for me, I, I prefer to do it that way these days. I do genuinely miss just like the grocery store to me is like target to some people. <laughs> like I just want to go in my car and peruse and see what's fresh and new and yeah. local. And I, I definitely miss doing that. I really, really, really do. Um, <laughs> but I mean, that's a first world prop. Like it's fine. Right. Uh, we'll get back to that one day, hopefully. Um, but yeah, I, I also, at the beginning of the pandemic, like when there were whispers that this, yeah. gonna happen, that this was going to happen, I was the woman that was like vacuum sealing like meat and fish. <laughs> and my family was like, what is wrong with you? And now they're like, oh, can I have like, can I have some of that steak that you throw? Like, <laughs> <laughs> so. Oh, yeah. man. That's, yeah, that's thinking ahead for you. Yeah. Is that, um, so it makes so yeah. Thinking about the shopping also got me thinking about you talking about getting a, and you've you've mentioned this many times to me before. But like the idea of getting kids to help out with the dish uh, in your household too. Are you starting to see that kind of like take effect? Do you are the kids like you know what? Maybe I might want to try this, or I might want to try this, or like how's that developed? Are there a bunch of little chefs running around at this point? Yes. So there's <laughs> two different sides to this. Cannon's still too young. He just turned two. Yeah. With Riley and Ryan. So Riley's our eight year old and she like she can make a mean scrambled egg. Like she can she's she can do it. She and she'd probably do more if we um if we let her. Um, but I'm still like I still am I'm a hover mother. <laughs> still, like over her head. Um she'll make the kids breakfast some morning. She's like takes no way. Yeah, yeah, which I'm fine with because you guys know I'm not not the biggest breakfast girl. So I'm like, okay, go ahead, girl. She'll like, <laughs> pour, she'll, we'll, we'll make the batter together and she'll pour the pancakes and flip them. It's like, oh, it's that's amazing. Wild. Oh, and wow. Ryan is like our adventurous eater. So she's our oyster girl. She loves oysters. She'll eat anything really you put in front of her. <laughs> um, I always said my kids didn't like chocolate, but I saw her eating chocolate the other day. So <laughs> I don't, I don't, I think anything goes for her. Yeah. And um, she she's more at that stage of cooking where I go to the microwave and there's some like marshmallows and a jalapeno pepper in a to go container <laughs> up to a pulp. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, what are you doing? And she's like, I was making something for you. <laughs> like, that's not how we do it. It's not how we do it. 
<laughs> She's experimenting um, with pl- flavor profiles. Right. That's evident. <laughs> so she'll, she'll, she, I know she'll come around, but whew. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. I love that one. You know, have you, is there any dish, because uh, I remember as a kid, like making a scrambled egg the right way. It's like a big accomplishment, right? Especially if yeah. you, yeah, like that's the moment. Is there anything that is in your repertoire that you're like, I nailed that. This is my flex dish. Like I nailed this and this is the one, this is the thing that let me know like, all right, I think I know what I'm doing at this point. Yeah. yeah. So in the book, there is a recipe and I'm assuming you want one from this book. So yes. Yeah. It's, the, it's definitely the poached halibut. Mm. This turmeric poached halibut and I pair it with the brown butter apple uh, sweet potato mash. And it is like, it's not necessarily the preparation of the dish. Well, I guess going into making it, I had never, I never poached fish before. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't anything I thought to do. I thought in my mind, oh, this must take a long time. It's not, it's super quick and easy. Um, and so I had this amazing um, dish um, of poached poached lobster at Michael Mina's restaurant. Mm-hmm. Um, he does the saffron in there. Mm-hmm. And the- amazing and then when I was filming family food fight uh one of the contestants named Tammy made this killer poached fish um and like wowed all of us judges and so I was like I need I need to have my version of that <laughs> and so in came the 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 poached um halibut with the turmeric and that pairing like that again that sweet and savory with uh-huh. the brown apple sweet potato mash and it's just like it's a match made in heaven and it's one of those things that I like to make for people to like really impress them, mm. uh, even though it's very easy. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I think that's like, I'm still nervous about that one. Like, no, I, don't, I, be, don't be. Okay. All it's right. Like, okay. Honestly, it's, it's do it. What? Try it once and you'll, you'll, you'll want to do it again. And again. I'll be solid. Like, All right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I got you covered. The, um, I always forget to ask about, uh, I always forget to ask you, about the television work too. I don't know much about this. Like I know, I don't know what goes into doing like a family food fight or anything like that, but I'd be curious to hear, uh, you know, what is that, what are those processes like? What's it like filming my, you know, like you don't have to speak to any specifically, uh, but I'm just curious about it. What is that food like? Fight. Food fight was kind of grueling. Yeah. Uh, from my perspective, just because uh, Canon was eight weeks old when we started filming. And they're 15 hour long days. And so- Oh, wow. Yeah, so with shows like that, like what you see is what you get. So a lot of people are like, oh, do they actually have that much time? Like, are they, are they, are they, do they know about the the challenge before it happens? No, they don't. And everything is in real time. Like you're not even seeing, once it's edited, you're not even seeing an eighth of like what's going on because they, they have, the full like what we what we the directives that we give them they actually have that full time oh i see um, and like the time is put into the judging and all of that stuff and so it really is a process um and then with i would say what could we talk about like my food network show mm-hmm. that was a process too um because it was filmed in our home yeah and, uh, once the cameras stopped rolling the cameras are still there for the next day of shoot so that was a, that was a process but <laughs> At the end of the day, I love it um, just because I love showing people that joy in cooking and like just the joy of getting people together. Yeah. Um, and so I, I, I do love, I, I love the process. Yeah. I yeah. I mean, I, and I think like people, the, the joy that you get out of this stuff, I think people get that from you seeing you do these things. And right now, like with all the stuff that's happening in the country, I think it's more important than ever to have these, uh, like for yeah. young women of color, especially to have someone that they can look up to that's bringing like this positivity kind of into the world. Um, this year, like, is that, I, I know it's, I, I've asked you about this even before like this year uh, and I know it's important to you, but do you think more about it now, especially like with um, like what your role could be for a young woman who, you know, or a young person who might be, you know, want to follow your plan? I don't think about it more because it's yeah. something I've always thought about. Mm-hmm. It was one of those things where I didn't know how to execute my thoughts into actions. 
And so now I think there's a there's a sense of empowerment to be able to put mm. all of those thoughts that I've been having, honestly, since I was a teenage girl into action. And I think I think we're coming to a point where I almost feel like I have more of a voice to, to be able an unapologetic voice. Yeah. To be able to say how I feel and what I think. And one of my big goals, especially uh, we announced a month ago, Sweet July Productions. And so a big goal of mine is to give specifically uh, women of color this platform, especially in culinary, to be able to showcase their skills um, on like a, a bigger platform and to be given the chance. Because I remember how hard it was for me to get a chance. And so, I mean, it's very important. It's very important to me to, to be able to, to, to help people foray into that world um, of food, whether it be on television or in the restaurant um because representation really does matter yeah um and i know we hear that saying over and over and over again but i mean we'll say it until you know yep it's there so yeah. it yeah. does matter and it, it, it i i do take pride in in um being one of the people that helps make that happen so yeah that's why i always like when, whenever we get to sit down because even people young people being able to see us do this right now could be significant for them. Yeah, like, that's maybe, very maybe, true. You know? So true. Um, so I, we're going to move to audience questions, but I want to ask you one okay. more thing because uh, you always answer the stuff and it's like, I can cross right. out the next ones. And it, it's, I'm a rambler. I just no, it's, <laughs> it's great. It's great. <laughs> but the one that you didn't get, because I didn't ask this one, was uh, I'm, I like to, I, I imagine that the cookbooks are like chapters in your life, right? Um, you started with your first one, you were at a completely different place, completely different life, just your family was different, and now to this one. So if you had to describe those, um, if you had to describe those books, I guess, as chapters of your life, what would each one contain? What would the season life be like, and what would full plate be like? Okay. So, ooh, wow. So I think the first cookbook was a culmination of my childhood and early adult life. It was very uh I want to use that word it was very introductory mm -hmm. I was like, basic and I was like it's not basic it's not basic yeah yeah I it's get basic. it it's never basic but it was very introductory so it was for the the novice cook um people that ha haven't ventured fully yet into the world of like diverse flavor mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. it was a more buttoned up maybe version of mm -hmm. of me and the way that I cook uh, it was also, there was a, a lot more time involved, like when it came to preparation, like recipe preparations, just because I had more time on my hands. Um, with this second book, um, I have no time on my hands. So it's, you know, I think it's a reflection of that, but it's exciting and creative and inventive, um, but still relaxed in a way yeah. and yeah. get the meal on the table. Um, but I think it's not this, this second book is not as closed off and it's while it's still for, it's for a, a cook of any level. So while it yeah. still can be for the novice cook, you know, they say like when, when a chef is done for the night, oftentimes a lot of them will go home and eat ramen. Yeah. yeah, so yeah. Like, it, it's like, yeah so that you don't have to go if you if you are experienced you don't have to go home and eat ramen like you can go ahead and prepare like the sambal cod in like five mm -hmm. minutes and be good and so it really is for every level uh, that you are at in your cooking yeah. journey nice that's perfect also uh, i i keep forgetting to highlight this there's a timing element too like these recipes yes uh, are none of them are more than an hour, I guess, or what is, what is or, it? Yeah, there's nothing longer than an hour in the cookbook, but I would say most of the recipes range from 15 to 30 minutes. So nice. there's That's some cool. that are less as well. Yeah. Like that cod recipe takes five. It's, it's just, it's, yeah, it's, you can pick your poison with this one. There you go. <laughs> Yeah. All right. So I'm going to move to the audience questions. You, the people sent some really good stuff. Um, let's see. Uh, there is a question from Crystal who's asking um, if you or I are familiar with the great food content, especially from creators of color. 
on social media platforms like TikTok. Um, and I and it says uh, there's a follow up that says I think some chefs are anti short form food videos, but they've been pretty helpful for me this quarantine. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I never thought that's about that. So interesting. Um, it's really interesting because I've always thought people just got entertainment from them. Yeah. So I need to know that it's been informative for some people. Yeah. Really, really cool. And I haven't, I actually, that's something I should take a deep dive into is like finding that talent that's out there. Um, doing the TikTok or the short form, we'll just generalize it, the short form cooking content. Right. Um, Cause I'm definitely on the hunt for uh, people like that um, to partner with. The only one I know about right now is Tabitha. Um, and so I'd be so interested to see everybody else. I'm always scouring like Instagram looking for, you know, the latest and greatest. Um, mm. and there's so much talent out there. Um, there's quite a few people that I follow that are doing amazing, amazing things. Um, oh, what is the, there's a group of men, uh, black men out of Brooklyn. Oh, what's their name? I can't remember their name and that's killing me and I don't want to pull out my phone to look. They're but doing food, food from stuff? Brooklyn, from Brooklyn. Um, and they just came out with this insane um, electric cookware line. So like a toaster oven, a toaster a blender. Um, and they partnered with this Brooklyn-based company as well. But just there's so many people doing amazing things out there. And I think what I might do then is put a list together of like who to look out for. Mm. Like, Cool. So yeah, thank that, you would, for that insight. <laughs> that would be cool. I yeah, I I am not. I need to start looking at TikTok. I get distracted by. I know. I, I get know. distracted by animal videos on there. So I got to start looking more at food stuff. So that that's on me. That's my fault. My kids just always have my phone TikToking. Yeah, my girls. <laughs> I mean, I was waiting for the one app that would make me think like, oh man, am I getting older? And yeah, it turned out to. Yep, turned out to be TikTok. Yeah. Um, all right, and let's see. Uh, there's a question from Anna, Hi, who Anna. wants who wants to know: Are there any up and coming chefs that you think we should be paying attention to? Um, anyone that's on your radar, or, or I'll add to that, like anyone in general that you think, you know. I yeah, I nobody knew somebody way cooler than I am, but I just think is so fantastic is Kwame. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I think they just announced he's doing top chef amateurs, which I think is, he's going to be judging that show, which yeah. I think is so cool. Uh, yeah. And he's just been, especially over these past nine, 10 months, yep. he's just been such an incredible advocate for restaurants and chefs in general, yep. like just boots on the ground, incredible. Um, just standing up for what we know as restaurants and chefs that everybody deserves. He's mm -hmm. been, he has been in the forefront of that. And so I think if I would pick somebody to follow along with right now, it would definitely be him. Yeah. Kwame at, I always, on a watch, I want to say is his last name. It's yeah. A, yeah. Yep. He, uh, so he's a, who, who's the question? Anna. Um, Anna. So he's a, I know he's, he, Still has his restaurant in DC, I think, or something. Yeah. Um, but he's a he's a, yeah he's a young black chef who um, has been on a couple of like cooking competition shows. Uh, he's had a memoir that is it's insane. So so good, so good. Um, a memoir. I think Kwame's probably in his twenties or something. Um, and yeah, no, he's just extremely talented. Their restaurant's really great and. Like Aisha said, he's definitely someone that's uh, worth paying attention to, um, yeah. for sure. And there's a question from Nick, and it says, uh, what's your favorite recipe that didn't make the cut for the book? My oxtail. <laughs> my oxtail that I grew up on. So I'm, I have my heritage is Jamaican and I love all things Jamaican food. And I, I noticed like when people picked up this cookbook, they were like, where are the Jamaican? 
Yeah. I think I put the rice and peas in there, but that was about it. And it's because I do have plans for something oh. that pays homage fully to my Jamaican roots that's in the works. And so I, <laughs> and it, the, a lot of those Jamaican recipes did not fit in with the theme of this book with it being super, super fast. Yeah, because uh, there's a lot of low and slow recipes when it comes to Jamaican cooking. And so I want to give it the respect that it deserves. <laughs> and yeah. so I think it needs its whole own thing. And so I would say my oxtail. Man, that would have been amazing. I think it's uh, I always think it's <laughs> yeah. Well, I can't wait to see whatever this next thing is for sure. But uh, yeah, it's always hard to do, I guess, if you're trying to do faster recipes. Yeah, it's hard to include the recipes where the person that makes them will be like, it's going to take a couple of hours and it'll taste better tomorrow after it sits for a little while. Right. Like exactly. <laughs> That's so true. That's so true. And nobody wants like rushed, tough oxtail. Nah, nah, of course not. All right. So let me let me get a couple more. So Tara. Hey, Tara. Tara has a question. Uh, it is as a self-taught chef, how did you develop your culinary skills? And what steps did you take along the way to get to where you are now? That's a great question. Yeah. So for me, I mean, I've been cooking since I was 12, really, um, for myself and for my family. Um, and so, I mean, to say natural instincts, that'd be very ignorant. It's not natural instincts. Like it was just the repetition of being in, in the kitchen from a young age and having that kitchen confidence instilled in me from a young age, which is also something that I advocate for is as a reason to give your kids a job in the kitchen. Um, and then I always say this, but I feel like Food Network raised me. <laughs> so like kids were watching cartoons. I was watching Rachel Ray Cook. I was watching Julia Child. Mm -hmm. I was watching Emerald. Like I, I, I was watching my grandma in the kitchen, my mom, like that. It was just always so exciting to me, but I did not know that I, I did not know that it could be a career for me. And mm. what I think is where that stems from representation. Mm. It's not something I saw. I, didn't, I never saw myself on cooking on a TV. I never saw myself. Oh, I never yeah. saw myself in a restaurant, you know, cooking on the line. I never saw it. And so yeah. I didn't know it was something that existed for me and I wish that I had, well, everything's fine. <laughs> but <laughs> I, I wish there had been somebody that told me, hey, this is something that you can do. But yeah, time goes on. Um, and so after I had my first daughter, Riley, I started just really being in California. We're so blessed here to have all of the amazing produce and farmers markets and local farms. And so I started to really do a deep dive into that and started to like, be like, oh, well, where does this come from? And it's not anything I'd ever thought about before. I'm like, shoot, I need to, I need to start cooking again. Cause I kind of mm. had fallen off a little bit. And then I, you know, started to get in the kitchen more. And I'm like, this brings me so much joy. What am I doing? And then people would come over and be like, this is delicious. I was like, you know what? Everybody started looking at me like, you need to do this for a career. Yeah. I'm like, okay. Maybe I'll start a blog. And so I started my blog um, and people took notice. It started out as a thing for my family at first. And then, because they're all on the East Coast and then people started to take notice. And then I had that lack of confidence of like, am I qualified to be doing this? And so I actually did end up going to San Francisco cooking school and taking like a very basic introductory fundamentals course. Mm. Um, but it actually, I actually gained so much knowledge um, from that course just on basic knife skills, technique, um, and it was really, really incredible. And so that that little course gave me the confidence I needed to just run with it, and I haven't looked back ever since. And then just picking people's brain. Like yeah. when you see somebody in a position that you admire, don't be afraid to go up and ask them what makes them tick or what they think about something that you're inquisitive of, they'll almost always be willing to answer that question. Um, yeah, and so I took it upon myself to just never stop asking questions. Even to this day, all I wanna do is is learn from the best of them, so. Nice, that's a great answer. Uh, 
So then we'll do a couple of quick ones, then I'm going to try to squeeze one more of my own on the end. So George uh, wants to know, do you think, hey, George, do you think the restaurant industry will be able to go back to what it was like, excuse me, before the pandemic? Hey, that's a tough question. Yeah. I, it's hard when you're in the thick of something to answer to that and to speak to that. I do think that restaurants will get back to a great place, but I have a feeling that they're always going to look a little bit different. Like the protocols and practices, I think will be a lot different going forward as they should be. I mean, you got to keep up with the times and this is where we're in right now. I mean, I think it, it's like the same question, you know, when you run out to the store really quick and you put on your mask, you're like, are we always going to have to wear masks? I hope not, but I don't, I don't know. And so I think there, there will be some things that stick and some things that don't. That's great. That's a great answer. And Adam, uh, Adam wants to know what is the most inspiring thing about San Francisco to you? Well, the food. Hello. (laughs) Definitely the food and the talent that's out here. Um, and I'm going to generalize that, not just the San Francisco, I'm going to open it up to the whole Bay area. Um, I just feel so inspired the second I step out and touch road, like the second I leave the house and go into the world, like I, the people here just have such, no matter what chaos is going around in the midst of tragedy, I still see people have this spirit of hope. And it like, it, it just, it inspires me so much. Um, and it's something that I haven't found anywhere else. I've never found such a, a lust for life, like any, and in and, 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 and any other place. Um, and so like, no matter where we go, we're always ready to come back home here just because of the vibrancy of the, of the city and the, the area in general. Um, we just love it. That's great. That's yeah. Yeah. It's uh San Francisco can be a special place for mm-hmm. sure. Um, so I'm going to toss one to you. The, um, so I asked about this before and I do think like people, the reason why I think this book is so perfect for right now, because there are a lot of, um, comfort food dishes. There's a lot of like flavor. There's a lot of filling things. If you want to, you know, if you want to make those, like there's so many options. Um, but you can include the book, but just on a personal note, for you, what is uh, what is comfort food to you? Like in your, doesn't have to be a dish, but just like explain like what comfort food means to you right now. And then maybe give, an, give me an idea of what a dish of comfort Perfect. food would be. Okay. So for me, comfort food is the Jamaican side of me. So it is that oxtail, rice and peas. Mm. Because I like, well, now I've had my dose of family because we were in Canada for so long. But before that, like being home and not seeing anybody was tough. And it, it kind of made me, making those dishes made me feel closer to them because mm-hmm. uh, I felt like it was a little piece of them. And then I would say like on a regular basis, like even pre-pandemic, like when I want com- comfort food, for me, it really is the, the um, pasta farians, the, the whole pasta chapter in general. Nice. I guess there's something about it that just makes me so happy. It always pleases everybody and satisfies everybody. And it almost seems like no matter how much I make, so sometimes I'll double, double the recipe and make like twice the amount, obviously. Um, and it, the bottom of the pot always seems to appear. Like it's <laughs> never enough. I'm like, oh, I'll make double tonight so I can put some in the fridge for tomorrow. No, (laughs) no, it's always somebody sneaking, getting seconds. It's awesome. And so I just love like the joy that it brings my family. If the, uh, yeah, so what's a, in your household, we'll think of before pandemic and once this ends and we can get back to some normalcy. Give people like an idea of what a dinner party over there would be like. An on point dinner party where you're like, yeah, we're gonna an on we're gonna, point dinner party. Okay. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna turn up today and it's gonna be fun. Like what's what's one of those like? So an on point dinner party would probably be me making the Serrano margaritas. Mm-hmm. Start out, 
Um, I would make the bacon wrap figs from the first cookbook. Oh. Um, and and the smoked fish dip from from the full plate to have for people that like to dip little pita chips and tortillas and things into. Um, and I think I would make. Um, I would. Oh, what would I do? Oh, there's so many options. <laughs> Um, see, I, sometimes I do a mishmash of, of different things. Um, so I have two options. So it would either be a big vat of that crab bucatini um, because people love it. Mm -hmm. Um, or I would do my Chinese five spice fried chicken, um, with some waffles on the side. Ooh. Um, there's a ham and cheese waffle in the first book that's like really good with the, the fried chicken. Or you could do the coconut rice with the fried chicken because it has that Chinese Asian mm -hmm. influence. Mm -hmm. um, that drizzle of honey, a little hot sauce. It's so good. People request my fried chicken all the time when they come into town. And so it would probably be that. Um, a nice big salad on the side for people that like salads. <laughs> uh, that's why that chapter is called for good measure. Yeah, I noticed that. <laughs> All right, if, if we have to, if, 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 <laughs> if this is if this but, is what you want, but they're still delicious. They're still delicious. Still great. Nothing um, like that. And then oh, the roast pears in the book. like that. It's for some reason it it's the it's one of the easiest desserts to make, but it impresses the it impresses people. I love that. That's yeah, awesome. Mean ice cream. Mm. Call it a day. So now everyone, you have your blueprint to throw a, uh, once this is all over with and it's safe to hang out again, you could throw in an identical yes. party. It'd be pretty dope. Absolutely. So. And a good playlist. Oh, a good playlist. A good playlist. Uh, is there anything that has to be on your playlist? Yes. <laughs> it's a little ratchet. Uh, there's this Jamaican artist named Spice and her music is on point. Spice and Popcorn. There you go. Surviving. Nice. Okay. So um, it is an uh, so Aisha. It is an informed tradition to ask all our speakers the following question: okay. What is your six? What is your sixty-second idea to change the world? <gasps> My sixty-second idea to change the world. To change the world. For everyone in their individualized communities to come together um, and each take what they're good at in a sense and come together and form a plan to make sure that the kids in the neighborhood are taken care of. So to really form like that true Ooh. village ship to like make sure that your neighbor, kind of like the cup of sugar effect, mm -hmm. you know, if you need something, I'm here. And just to really create that safe open space for people um, and ultimately, I think that that would help in ending childhood hunger because everybody would be helping out one another and looking out, truly looking out for each other. So. That's great. Yeah. There you go. Um, so thank you, Aisha, for joining us thank you. today. This was thank so much fun. So much. Um, so thank you for joining us at the Commonwealth Club. Uh, we'd like to remind our audience that Aisha's new book, The Full Plate, is now there you go is now available at your preferred bookseller uh if you'd like to watch more virtual programs or support the commonwealth club's efforts in make making virtual programming please visit commonwealthclub.org online i am justin phillips thanks everybody and stay safe out there bye